our usual drill applies. You have in your program the forms in which you put your questions, which come to me and which I'll then organize. That's as it always was. And then uh, starting 35 minutes or so, while the lecturers are still lecturing, we will have people collecting those questions and bringing them to me so I can get them organized in categories. And apart from that, and requiring a different form of question handling from you, you have a survey that has been uh, distributed, and it comes in a pre and post form. This is from our assessment officer, Daria Cota Schwartz, an engineering professor who is assessing this project. She has been working, she and Mike Hannigan have been working with a group of students from the CU Social Surveys for Environmental Studies class. There they are. Look at, they're working very hard. There they are. Uh, so what they will do when the lecturers finish lecturing, which will be a sad moment for us all, really, to have that come to a halt, but we'll be distracted from our sadness by having the young folks pick up the pre-survey. At that point, you may begin on your post-survey, but your pre-survey reflects a different consciousness than your post-survey consciousness, I would assume, right? Yeah, okay, so you must make sure that you are filling out the pre-survey until you, then you hand that in and you shift over to your new consciousness, which will be a wonderful thing to see when you all have a new consciousness. Um, although the, the one you started with tonight was fine to me, it was totally fine from here. Nick Flores is next week, uh, he'll be talking on the economics of fracking this Thursday night. In this room at 6.30, Elliot West, the most accomplished Western American historian among us really, will be here getting the Stegner Award, so you might want to join us for that. Uh, we have, someone's pointed out, we have a schedule conflict on May 21st. So looking ahead to our last lecture, that has been moved to May 22nd. So our custom, which is almost becoming a religious or cultural practice of meeting every Tuesday, we will shift that to Wednesday on May 22nd. Okay, um, it is now my pleasure to introduce our speakers who, as you know, understand the program are modest to a fault. Those are the most brief and succinct and humble statements of extraordinarily successful and important and consequential careers. Jenna Milford is um, a professor here in the engineering department, and she has worked on many important issues of air quality. She also holds a law degree from the, from the uh, CU School of Law. Gabby Patron is at the, is at the National Association excuse me, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, where she is in the Earth Systems Research Laboratory, where she's an associate scientist. I think they did that on purpose of making it so brief. I could talk about what incredibly charming and gracious people they are. I could do all of that, and I think our purposes as citizens of the United States would be better served if I just brought them up here and <laughs> skip the part about it. But if anyone would like to come up afterwards and ask to hear the heartwarming stories about them, I, would be, I will be here and I'll be ready to, to provide those. So join me in welcoming Jenna Milford and Gabby Petro. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, can you hear me okay in the back? All right, I have to figure out what to do with this mic that I don't want to hold. Um, and I don't have pockets. Can, so yeah. I'll try a clip here. All right, still working? Okay. Um, so I'm delighted to be here tonight. My job as part of this twosome is really to lay a foundation. Um, part of my title is that I'm going to give you the primer on um, air impacts from oil and gas. And I would ask you to note that the word fracturing um, and the word fracking are not in my title. Um, I'm going to throw out to the audience a little challenge. Um, if you hear me say either fracking or fracturing during my talk, raise your hand. Okay? And we'll talk a little bit. <laughs> we'll talk a little bit at the end, or you can ask in the end if I don't remember to say it, why I brought that up. All right? But that's a little teaser. Okay, now let's see if we can operate the slides. Yes. All right. So again, I'm going to kind of try to lay a foundation, and then um, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Gabby Pichon, who has the cool stuff to show tonight. She's going to talk more about the research side um, of, of air emissions and, and um, their association with oil and gas. But I want to lay a foundation, talk about production trends in the state of Colorado. Um, those of you who've been coming to the seminar series have seen some of that before. We'll talk about just what are the air pollutants that we're concerned about coming from oil and gas activities. 
Um, and we'll talk about where those pollutants come from. So what are some of the specific pieces of equipment and activities that lead to emissions um, of air pollutants of concern? And then I want to talk at the end a little bit about regulatory oversight of air pollution from oil and gas. Um, this isn't quite the Wild West out there. There actually is a lot of activity going on already to try to manage these air impacts. And so I'll give you a little bit of a flavor of where that comes from. And um, throughout, I've, I've um, utilized some of the photos from one of the students in our group. Joanna Gordon is here tonight. Um, and I just want to thank her for, for letting me borrow some of those pictures. I've got some others from some other folks as well. So this is a map you've probably seen before. This is a map that shows the active oil and gas wells in the state of Colorado as of October 2012. Um, there were about 49,000 wells. Um, you see a pretty heavy concentration in northeastern Colorado in Weld County especially, but extending all the way out to Yuma County on the Kansas line and up to the Wyoming line. There's also a lot of activity in western Colorado, um, a lot centered in um, the three counties of Rio Blanco, Garfield, and Mesa County, and then quite a bit of activity in La Plata County um, in the San Juan Basin on our border with New Mexico. So what you'll see as we go forward is that some of those areas are areas where air pollution is a concern. I mean, in some cases, a long-established concern, and in other cases, a growing concern. These are some graphs of marketed natural gas production and oil production in the four mountain states, um, Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming. And what you see, Colorado is a kind of sky blue line that has this nice, pretty straight, pretty consistent upward trend over the last couple of decades. Um, we're now the leading natural gas producer amongst those four states. Wyoming takes that prize. Um, and previously, up until about 2000, um, 2005 rather, New Mexico was the leading natural gas producer um, amongst the four states in this area. Um, crude oil production shows a somewhat different picture. Instead of the steady increase, um, we've seen some fluctuations, some dips in oil production. In Colorado, um, we actually peaked around 1990, then had a low point around 2000, and then over the last um, 10 or, or 13 years, we've been seeing increased oil production again. Um, so both gas production and oil production are going to be important in terms of air quality impacts. We've got to look at both of those. All right, so what are some of the pollutants that we're concerned about? Um, the first category of pollutants that I want to talk about are the greenhouse gases. And greenhouse gases, the two primary ones of concern are going to be methane and carbon dioxide. So methane, of course, is going to be there if you're talking about natural gas, because that is what natural gas is for the most part. If you're looking at raw natural gas, it depends on the formation that you're getting the gas from, but it ranges from about 70 up to about 95% methane on a volume basis. There are other hydrocarbons associated with that gas, ethane, propane, um, butanes, and some higher um, alkanes and, and um, aromatics as well. And those can constitute up to 20% of the composition of raw natural gas. So it can be quite significant. Um, the denver julesburg Basin is an area where our natural gas is referred to as wet. And what that means is we have a fair amount of um, condensate or natural gas liquids associated with the gas production, and those are going to take the form of those um, organic compounds, the ethane, propane, butane, etc., that are associated. Natural gas can also contain um, nitrogen, molecular nitrogen, um, which is an inert compound. We're not too concerned about that. Um, carbon dioxide, which is something that has to be stripped out of natural gas in many situations. Um, some areas are... Um, are, are, have, have their gas, gas production complicated by the fact that they have significant quantities of hydrogen sulfide associated with the natural gas. Those are referred to as sour gas deposits. Um, in Colorado, we're fortunate not to have a lot of sour gas. We have relatively um, sweet, low hydrogen sulfide concentrations in the gas in Colorado. Um, so methane is a critical greenhouse gas. Um, if you look at its global warming potential on a 100-year basis, it's about 20 times as active in terms of radiative forcing as carbon dioxide is, um, pound per pound. If you look on a shorter time frame, um, it is even more um, potent, a greenhouse gas, um, than, than CO2. And it's going to be released 
any time in a, a gas situation that you have a leak, or um, in some cases deliberate venting of the, the natural gas. But it's also important to recognize that methane has other sources that are oftentimes located in the same basins that the natural gas wells are. Um, so in Weld County, for example, it's a, a really excellent example where there's a lot of methane associated with feedlots and um, livestock operations. It's also methane that's associated with landfills. So when you think about gas production, you're concerned about leakage or releases of methane into the atmosphere. But when you think about gas use, oftentimes you're thinking about benefits in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Because the greenhouse gas emissions that are associated with combustion of methane are less on a per unit of energy produced basis than the greenhouse gas or CO2 emissions associated with other fossil fuels. So if we're switching out coal for natural gas in a power plant, we're going to see a, a benefit in terms of the net um, carbon dioxide emissions associated with that combustion. So we've got a trade-off going between the potential for methane leakage in the production um, and distribution pathway and the benefit of a cleaner burning fossil fuel source. Um, The other suite of uh, air pollutants that um, you'll hear more about tonight are what I'll refer to as criteria pollutants. And criteria pollutants is really just a term of art that comes historically from the listing of these pollutants in the Clean Air Act. And um, as part of the Federal Clean Air Act legislation, EPA is required to set standards for six criteria pollutants, carbon monoxide, ozone, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, particulate matter, and lead. And the ones that are going to be of most concern if we're talking about oil and gas sources are ozone, to a lesser degree, nitrogen dioxide, and particulate matter. We see those three criteria pollutants associated with gas production. So with the criteria pollutants, EPA is required to set these standards. The standards are intended to be set at a level that's protective of human health and welfare. And so once you've got a standard set, um, states and local agencies are responsible for um, instituting whatever control pr programs are actually required to ensure that those standards are met in their particular local area. Um, in Colorado, uh, we see issues with ozone, issues with particulate matter in some areas, and the potential for issues with nitrogen dioxide. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about those. Ozone's the one um, that's probably most familiar to folks in the Front Range. Um, why do I say that? Anybody know? Do we have an ozone problem? Um, Denver has been struggling for many years to come into attainment with the federal standards for ozone. And um, the Denver non-attainment area for, for ozone is actually a nine-county area that includes Boulder County um, and extends up into Larimer and part of Weld County as well. Um, ozone forms in the atmosphere. It's not directly emitted by any sources, but it forms in the atmosphere from reactions involving sunlight, nitrogen, nitrogen oxides, and volatile organic compounds. So the nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds have many sources, but among them are numerous oil and gas activities and pieces of equipment. Um, Additional sources that sort of complicate the picture if you're trying to sort out the source of an ozone problem. Motor vehicles are important sources of both nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds. Um, vegetation is a really important source of volatile organic compounds. If you take a stroll in the forest and you smell the aromatic smell, those are volatile organic compounds that you smell. Um, gasoline, paints, and solvents are going to be other sources as well. So, Ozone is of concern because of its health effects primarily. It also affects vegetation, but we're most concerned about the human health effects. Um, respiratory symptoms are um, common when people are exposed to ozone at high levels. Over longer periods of time, lung inflammation can result from exposure. Um, people who have asthma experience increased numbers of asthma attacks in the presence of high ozone. And there are epidemiological studies that have statistically related ozone concentrations to premature mortality. So it's a serious um, health concern when, when ozone levels get elevated. There was a study that was just released um, a couple weeks ago in Wyoming 
that looked at Western Wyoming, Sublette County, which is the area around P Pinedale, um, Wyoming, and, and really the core of the natural gas development in that state, um, that showed a statistically significant increase in clinic visits with residents in this very small community. Pinedale has a population of about 2,000 people. Um, but with a 10 part per billion increase in ozone, they could see a 3% increase in the number of clinic visits for respiratory um, illness. So EPA has set a standard for ozone. The standard is set at um, 0 0.075 parts per million for an eight hour average basis. And that becomes the yardstick for all of the um, locales and, and counties and, and cities around the country to determine if, if their um, air is, is healthy in terms of this particular pollutant. So we're comparing to that 0.075 part per million level the design value that I have indicated in the chart. And the design value is a very obscure um, mathematical definition. It's the average over the past three years of the fourth highest eight hour average concentration um, in each of those years. So you have to do a lot of averaging to come up with a design value. But anyway, um, if you're above 0.075, it's bad. If you're below it, it's okay. Maybe not perfect, but a little bit better. Denver, the Front Range, um, were really considered to be marginal non-attainment. We're fairly close to the standard, um, but we need to be below it. Um, in the Western Slope, depends on the monitoring location, the specific locale that you're looking at, but the design values range from 0.064 to 0.074. Some places are really getting close to a non-attainment status. Um, Upper Green River Basin is what I mentioned just a minute ago, Sublette County and the Pinedale area. Um, they have a design value now of 0.078. They are non-attainment for the ozone standard. This is a rural community that doesn't have a whole lot of industrial activity except for oil and gas operations, um, some other energy production. And what's really special about their ozone levels is that in Sublette County they see high concentrations in the wintertime. I mentioned earlier that ozone is formed in the atmosphere from sunlight driven reactions, so we expect to see it as a summertime problem, and that's certainly where you hear about it around here. Um, when people are asking you not to drive or not to mow your lawn at four o'clock in the afternoon, that's our summertime ozone problem. But what we're seeing in some of these oil and gas basins is a new emergence of a wintertime ozone phenomenon, and I'm gonna let Gabby talk a little bit more about that um, shortly. So, Uinta Basin, um, which is the northeastern corner of Utah and the area around Vernal and then up towards Dinosaur National Monument um, is seeing a similar wintertime ozone phenomenon. They're not yet um, declared to be non-attainment because they don't have enough years of data, um, but they're expected to be non-attainment there. Um, again, most of the emissions are, are associated with oil and gas operations. All right, last category of air pollutants that you need to know about if you're going to engage in a discussion about these is hazardous air pollutants. And these are a very long list of individual uh, pollutant compounds that are known um, to be capable of harming human health if people are exposed at high enough levels for long enough periods of time. So the presence of a hazardous air pollutant isn't necessarily a concern. If it's a low concentration or a short exposure, it may not cause any harm at all. But at the right, long enough duration and the high enough levels, these are pollutants of concern. So EPA does not set ambient standards for these like they do for the criteria pollutants, but rather they directly set emission standards or impose control requirements on sources that might release them. Um, some of the hazardous air pollutants that are associated with oil and gas, the most prominent ones are going to be benzene and formaldehyde. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about both of those, but recognize that they're not just coming from oil and gas sources. For benzene, motor vehicles, gasoline are also sources, important sources. Um, for formaldehyde, um, most people's formaldehyde exposure probably is dominated by cigarette smoke. Um, there are also a lot of consumer products, um, some wall boards that are contaminated with formaldehyde, um, vehicle exhaust, and then formaldehyde like ozone is another pollutant that's formed in the atmosphere from chemical reactions. So it's not always emitted directly from a source. Um, this is an example of some of the benzene concentrations that have been measured in the front range. And um, the top graph actually shows the front range, the bottom graph shows some of the western slope benzene concentrations that have been measured. Um, the top graph is measurements from the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment 
in two locations, downtown Denver, right in the middle of downtown, the kind of the heart of, of the city, and then Platteville. Um, and Platteville is just um, east of I-25 in, in Well County, and kind of the core of the um, oil and gas operations in Well County. And so what you see is Platteville concentrations of benzene being higher than those in central Denver, which is a little bit of a surprise. Um, and that's consistent across the years that are represented by the data. The good news is that the benzene concentrations do seem to be coming down over time. Uh, part of that's attributable to controls on benzene for motor vehicles. Um, EPA has made significant efforts to um, have um, the um, oil refiners reduce the benzene content of gasoline, and that's had an important effect. Um, but some of it is also probably due to um, tightening control requirements for oil and gas operations. Um, if you look at the western slope, benzene concentrations in rifle and parachute um, are comparable, um, pretty comparable to those in Platteville currently. Um, so all of those benzene concentrations above where you'd like to see them, but there is some, some hope in, in the fact that the concentrations are coming down. Okay, now I want to turn um, to a, just a little bit of um, kind of getting back to my foundations and, and primer notion, um, a little bit of information on what the equipment and sources in the oil and gas industry are for some of these pollutants that we've been talking about. So um, the top one, uh, condensate storage tanks, is probably the thing that's most familiar. If you drive um, up I-76 or, or even out to, to Erie um, these days, you see plenty of condensate storage tanks, and ours in Colorado are always this a nice tan color. Um, I have a colleague who's working in, in Texas, and they have this beautiful sky blue storage tank in Texas. I think we need to get our paint color changed. But um, the condensate tanks were actually one of the, the first sources that were really recognized as significantly um, producing volatile organic compound emissions from the oil and gas industry. And what happens is that these tanks are storing um, the liquids that are produced in association with the gas. Some of the tanks are also storing water, but the ones of concern are the ones that are storing condensate. And when the temperature increases, some of that liquid evaporates. Um, if the pressure um, drops, some of that liquid is going to go into the gas phase. And when that occurs, um, an uncontrolled storage tank will vent some of um, those hydrocarbons to the atmosphere. Um, since 2004 in Colorado, we've had control requirements for our storage tank, and they've gotten increasingly tight over time. Um, so that now you'll see um, oftentimes a flare associated with um, a tank battery, where the flare is designed to burn off or combust those um, vapors once they get released to the atmosphere. Um, so that's the condensate storage <coughs> tank. Uh, another common piece of equipment that you'll see is the glycol dehydrator. Um, oftentimes they're pretty readily identified as just very tall cylinders um, that you'll see on a well pad or in conjunction with, with um, oil and gas operations. And their job is to strip the moisture out of the gas when it's pulled out of, of the ground. So it's going to have some water associated with it. Glycol dehydrators absorb that water by circulating glycol. Um, and as that glycol circulates, it doesn't just absorb water, it also pulls in some of the hydrocarbon um, gases from, from the natural gas. And so glycol has to be cleaned at the end of its absorption cycle. It gets regenerated by heating it up in what's known as a reboiler. And when that occurs, um, guess what happens to some of those vapors? They're going to get released into the atmosphere. Once again, though, there's a mechanism for controlling that. And Colorado, um, also since 2004, has had requirements for glycol dehydrators to utilize control equipment. And similar to the story with the condensate storage tanks, those um, requirements have been tightening over time and, and will yet get tighter as, as time goes forward. Um, another important source of air pollution in the oil and gas industry is the compressors that are used to maintain or boost the pressure of the gas as it is carried through on very, very long miles and miles of pipelines. Those compressors um, burn natural gas at high temperature, and in so doing, they produce nitrogen oxides that are released to the atmosphere. So one of the two ingredients of ozone, the nitrogen oxides, is going to come off at times from compressors. Um, those can be controlled and are required to be controlled to some extent um, through improved um, compressor engine design and through control devices that um, use catalytic um, chemistry in order to um, 
reduce the nitrogen oxides to molecular nitrogen. Another thing that you'll hear about is pneumatics. And when we think of pneumatic devices, um, we usually think of somebody using um, compressed air to actuate some mechanical motion. Um, but in the gas industry, the gas that you have at high pressure that's available to use pneumatically is natural gas. And so pneumatic devices in the gas industry are a little bit different than what you think of elsewhere. Um, oftentimes pneumatic devices are designed to continuously bleed a little bit of natural gas and the associated vapors into the atmosphere, either to maintain pressure or in some cases to keep um, the, the control devices from, from freezing. It can be a temperature control effect as well. Um, so that's going to be another source of these hydrocarbons and methane. Um, that can be controlled by replacing um, the devices with lower bleed rate devices or eliminating the bleed um, altogether. There are no bleed devices available. can also be replaced in some special circumstances by using compressed air or replacing that pneumatic actuation with an electrical signal. Oops. We're stuck. There we go. Okay. <laughs> really stuck. All right. So, so far I've been talking about equipment that's used in primarily the production and processing phase of um, natural gas. I want to mention the drilling phase um, now. And one thing to note about the drilling phase is it's relatively short in duration. These devices and equipment that are used in production can be out there for years and years and years. Um, drill rigs, in contrast, are typically out for a matter of a few weeks at a particular location it can be longer than that if they're drilling multiple wells from a single um, pad location. Drill rig engines, um, like compressor engines, are going to release nitrogen oxides because um, they involve high temperature combustion. Um, they also emit carbon monoxide, particulate matter, and um, some CO2 as a combustion source. Again, there are mechanisms to control those, um, but the drill rig engines tend to be somewhat harder um, to tackle um, for one thing, they're expensive. For another thing, they last a long time. So it's heavy equipment that kind of gets out in the field and gets moved around, um, but it's not something that gets replaced with all new equipment um, from one year to the next. The other um, thing that goes along with this sort of transitory mode of well um, drilling and completions is the completion stage. And completions refer to um, the well cleanup that have to occur, has to occur after hydraulic fracturing. Yay! <laughs> um, that process is going to release hydrocarbons and methane to the atmosphere again, and to a greater or lesser degree depending on how you control it. So what we're doing at that stage is we've injected um, liquids and propent into the well in order to affect the fracturing process. That stuff has to thank you. Um, come back out of the well at some point before the gas is produced and, and really starts flowing into the sales line. So when they pull those fluids back out, the flow back is gonna sometimes vent um, methane and, and other compounds into the atmosphere. Um, the degree to which that controls really depends on how quickly they can get that flow back material cleaned up the gas separated out of it, and then once the gas is separated and at high enough pressure, they can connect it to the sales line. So you hear about green completions. That's a process for accelerating that separation and getting the gas um, linked into a sales line more quickly. And they can really accelerate it quite a bit so that the amount of emissions that occur can be reduced by 90% or more. All right, the last thing I want to mention about controls um, is the problem of leaks. Leaks is a big problem. Um, you can imagine all those pipelines, all those valves, all that plumbing associated with natural gas production, all of it has the potential to leak. And lots of leaks um, that are very, very widely distributed over miles and miles of pipelines. So um, since 1985, natural gas processing plants have been required to conduct leak detection and repair programs in the gas industry. Um, but that was pretty much isolated to the large gas processing plants that you see. Um, what can go on beyond that and what's important to conduct is, is what's known as directed inspection and maintenance. And that's a mechanism for going out and surveying these miles and miles of pipelines and valves and all the connectors to look for leaks. And when you find them, um, repair them. So 
So directed inspection and maintenance has been um, greatly aided by some advances in technology. Um, there are now infrared cameras that are available for use that can um, see in the infrared um, gas emissions, methane emissions that would be invisible to the naked eye. Um, so that's been an important tool for assisting in that mechanism. And there are some new efforts in Colorado as well. Um, I think one of the big challenges with air quality and air emissions in the sector is just that it's such a widely distributed source. Um, all of Well County, all of northeastern Colorado have to be surveyed and inspected um, and maintained. And so um, there are new experiments going on with remote telemetry devices that can be used to detect problems um, at well sites or problems in other equipment um, remotely without having to be visited by an individual. Okay, I want to finish up really quickly so I can turn it over to Gabby. I mentioned at the beginning that there is a lot of regulatory activity that addresses air emissions in this sector. Um, so at the state level, both the Colorado Department of Public Health and the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission have a piece, a role to play in terms of regulating emissions. Um, the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission in particular has oversight for the completions and drilling process. They deal with the temporary sources at those stages. Um, we also have a lot of um, gas leases in Colorado that are issued and overseen by the Bureau of Land Management. Um, these are leases that occur on public lands or leases of federal minerals in split estate, estate situations where the federal government has held on to the mineral rights. Um, so the BLM has authority for that and as part of that authority um, they can do and, issue, and do issue environmental um, and air mitigation requirements. Um, EPA, as we've talked about, issues these ambient standards. The ozone standards themselves have really driven a lot of the control activity that we see in Colorado. Um, so they, they kind of trace back to the federal requirements. Um, there are also uh, significant oil and gas activities that occur in Indian country in the state of Colorado. Um, the Southern Ute Tribe has most of the oil and gas um, activity in the northern San Juan Basin in La Plata County. And that tribe is actually one of the leading tribes around the country um, in developing its own um, resources and management efforts for managing air quality impacts of, of their energy development activities. Um, we've got local and county opportunities. Um, that's a, a bone of some contention in Colorado at the moment. But what Boulder County is trying to do um, in the new program that they're going to um, introduce this summer is to offer expedited um, permitting for companies that are willing to adopt especially proactive and protective um, measures to, to reduce air emissions and other um, safety and environmental concerns. So um, that hasn't gone into effect yet and, and it'll be interesting to see how that works out. Um, when um, private individuals are leasing minerals, they also have an opportunity with their um, lease agreements and surface use agreements to um, modify environmental practices and, and improve environmental protect practices that occur on their property. And then finally, um, you have to give a lot of credit for the oil and gas industry having undertaken a lot of voluntary efforts in this space of um, working to reduce air emissions over many years. Um, many of the control requirements that have been adopted in, to regulation were first um, developed under voluntary efforts um, that the oil and gas companies have, have undertaken. So, that I'm about out of um, voice, <laughs> which is good because it's very much time to turn it over to Gabby. And um, three cheers to all of you who were listening attentively enough to capture when I said capture. <laughs> Several cheers. <laughs> Does this work? Uh, here, I see the green light on. Yes. The green light is not. Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. I, I try to be a good, uh, a good it, person with a microphone. It's probably something you have to hold up pretty close. Close or not close? I think uh, close. Close. Okay. Let me know. You can wave your arm if you can't hear me. Okay. Let's open the next. All right. So I am part two. I hope you still have energy to listen to. Uh, a French woman 
talking with an accent about oil and gas. So I come from farm <laughs> country in Normandy, and uh, this is this was new to me uh, as far back as 2008. But I've been working on uh, trying to understand how oil and gas operation affect the local and the global atmosphere uh, for the past few years, and uh, it's an amazing journey, learning every day from from a lot of different people involved in uh, better understanding the impact. So I work at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in town. You're always welcome to come visit us. We have amazing tools for people who want to understand how we try to track how the composition of the global atmosphere is working. We have volunteers from around the world sending us air samples on a weekly basis, and that's how we keep track of uh, carbon dioxide, methane, and a few other gases, actually 50 of them, in, in the global atmosphere. So that's most of my time. I, I look at what's going on between Barrow, Alaska, and South Pole. But um, on my free time, uh, I, I try to uh, wander around, especially in Weld County, where I spend most of my time looking at oil and gas activities. It's been mostly work done in Weld County. But I've also done some work in Utah, in the Winter County. And uh, colleagues of mine have done work in, uh, a few years ago in Wyoming. So you'll see slides and some data from these places. And I'm an affiliate, I'm, uh, I'm an affiliate with uh, the University of Colorado, and I'm delighted to be part of this NSF grant to try to um, better assess with the tools we have and all the uh, stakeholders involved what the impacts are, and my main focus is on air quality. So this is a, a picture I love, hmm. and that's what brought me to study uh, earth sciences and specifically atmospheric sciences. I was a math student in Paris, and uh, so I, I told you I come from farm country. My dad was a father. Uh, my father was a teacher of far, for farmers. Okay, he taught them about accounting and taking care of the animals and stuff like that. And he pushed me to study math because that's the only thing. He became a psychologist later on in his life, but that's the only thing he, ne he never mastered mathematics. So I'm like, okay, I'll be a good daughter, and I'll do. Yeah, what my dad wants. So I studied math, but then after a while it became really dry. And, and that's when I took my first class in earth sciences. And the, the first slide my teacher showed us, he was an atmospheric scientist, was this. I'm like, this is so beautiful. So we all need to take, uh, to respect the fact that we are um, passing our life, is, we are here momentarily, right? So it's our responsibility to take care of where we live and our resources so that future genera generations can enjoy them as well as we do. And the atmosphere is one of these resources in my mind. And it's, um, it's a very small layer of air, you know, stuck on the, on the solid earth. And my passion is to study it and understand what's changing its composition. So as Jana talked about earlier, we Many things can affect the composition of the atmosphere. We know in general what it's made of. I mean, and what we're looking at in terms of pollutants is usually very, very small fractions. So that's where you need scientists and, and very expert people to be able to detect very small changes in very small concentrations. It's not easy business. And I'm really delighted to be working at NOAA, where people have been tracking really small changes in small concentrations over the past 30, 40, 50 years. So th the quality of the data here is critical and all along for atmosphere or water work. So as I mentioned earlier, the atmosphere composition can be impacted by natural and anthropogenic or human caused phenomena. And that's what we try to understand in my group by doing these measurements all over the world. We want to untangle what's coming from a volcano erupting somewhere uh, on this planet, or is it just a big increase in fossil fuel usage like we see in Asia in the past few years? So we, we are very much into trying to uh, base our decision and get information as much as possible from measurements. And as Jan mentioned earlier, the, the big, um, we are at a crossroad now where we've seen a depletion in conventional resources for fossil fuel reservoirs, but we have a large volume of what we call unconventional resources that we are just starting to tap. And that's where the boom that we see in oil and gas production in, in, in a lot of, uh, in several states in the US is, is starting to, 
to have an impact on local economy, but also potentially air quality. So pretty much when you want to study oil and gas operation, you need a lot of experts talking together. There's a lot of regulation going on. You, you want to monitor with scientists what's going on for your water and your air, but it's really important to include geologists and people, economists, who understand where we are going with this kind of activity. So we want to understand what are the potential emissions, but most specifically, what are the actual emissions that are coming from oil and gas exploration and production. And the potential impacts that we are looking at are, as mentioned by Jana earlier, ozone and its precursors. We want to understand the climate impact of oil and gas activities with these methane emissions. And there's another piece that's really important is um, the, the exposure to hazardous air pollutant, including uh, benzene. So we can already see from space, actually, if you, you know, come back from the moon and come a little bit closer and you look at uh, the US at night, we can see some of the flaring going on in some of the new oil and gas, mostly oil basins that uh, we have been exploring in, in North Dakota, the back end play, and then Eagle Force, Eagle Force in Texas. <coughs> this map uh, shows you where there's been an intensification of New wells being drilled and hydraulic fracturing is now used for 90% of the wells in the US. So, but um, this map is showing you that definitely there's a concentration of activity in some states. It's not always a country. And that explains why in some areas in the US people are not worried about it because they don't have it in their backyard. But definitely pretty much in our region, the Rocky Mountain region, we, we have uh, a big industry uh, continuing to boom or booming in new places and, and we need to better understand it. So how do we assess or how can one assess atmospheric impacts of an industry? So we have here I'm proposing two approaches and uh, we're looking specifically right now at emissions, what's coming out of uh, pumping gas out of the ground or oil and then sending it to consumers. So there's the inventory approach which is very much what um, regulators usually start with. They try to understand the catalog of the different pieces of equipment or the different activities that are going on in a field. And then they use emission factors, so how much is coming per unit of activity or per unit of equipment. And they do a simple math on a spreadsheet and they come up with numbers on how much they think could be coming or is coming out of, of an industry in a specific region for a specific time period. Well, the approach we use in our group, as I said, with the measurement is we go out there and we take air samples. Um, so I call it the evidence-based approach, where we, we try to study a problem at different scales and understand uh, what the largest contributors, for example, are. Another piece that we need to understand in terms of impact are ambient levels, and that's true for air pollutants like ozone, but also the air toxics. And one approach that is used especially for environmental impact assessment and uh, what states use to uh, decide how much new leases can be put um, for bid when, uh, especially when there's already a air pollution problem. They use a model to try to understand how a development in activity would impact uh, in the future the, the local air. And um, so that's a, a model approach. We use models also to understand if there's already a, a problem with air pollution like we have in, in, in the front range here, what kind of mitigation should they, should they put in place to, to mitigate the ozone problem, for example? So we use models to, to put scenarios um, as input and see what likely scenarios would give the results we want. Well, for ambient levels, uh, what we use again in, in our group is we go out there and, and we take measurements and we have different platforms that we use to do that. But then obviously a model, you can model pretty much any resolution you want from a few kilometers to you know, the whole globe. When we do measurements, it's really hard to be everywhere all the time. All right? So we have to make choices about where we go, what do we measure, uh, when do we measure and how do we do it, like what's going to be the best um, tool to answer a specific question we have. So as you've heard before, um, natural gas systems are, are huge infrastructures. And we go from a production site, I don't know if we have a pointer 
I don't see one. So we go from a production site and a big basin with thousands of wells to all the way to consumers. And the, the composition of the gas uh, will change as, as you go down the chain. And, and what I want people to realize here tonight is that unconventional oil and gas means a lot of oil and gas wells. They are not gushers like you see in, uh, in the Middle East. Okay? We have half a million oil and gas wells in this country. In Colorado, you've heard before, do you remember how many we have? Mm -hmm. 45,000, 50,000. Um, my, one of my good friends is not here, but I always joke that, um, it's not a joke actually, but um, the, the Middle East, they have around 35,000. Okay, so Colorado has more <laughs> oil and gas wells than the Middle East. Um, in this country, we have 5,000 processing plants. And these are, if it's in your neighborhood, you, you would want to know what's going on. They are highly regulated, though, and controlled. We need compressors along the pipelines to put the gas from uh, production to consumers. And we have around 1,400 compressors on the transmission network. And we have hundreds of thousands of miles of pipelines, obviously, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a huge infrastructure, and, and that's a big source of our energy in this country. Um, as of 2012, 36% of our uh, power electricity generation was uh, due to natural gas burning, and it's growing. So as you heard before, we, we need to understand when you want to study something, you need to know what's in there, right? If you want to study natural gas or potential impacts of natural gas exploration and production, you need to understand what you should measure. So it's like looking at the uh, ingredients of the whatever goes in what you eat. And with natural gas, we are lucky enough to have some data that the state is able to share with us. When, we go, when you go to different places, either you're in Utah or you're in Colorado, the gas itself that comes out of the ground has a different composition. And it's always very useful for us scientists just going out there to know ahead of time, or as we are doing the analysis of our data, what's in this gas. And we have limited data. A lot of this data is um, the property of the industry. But when the state pays for some uh, analysis or baseline studies to have composition, we have access to that, and that's very useful. But depending on if you have dry gas, as we mentioned earlier, or wet gas, you'll see uh, more or less methane and uh, more or less of the other hydrocarbons. So my big question when I joined our group at NOAA was like, can we measure that? Like, guys, do you, do you have instruments? I'm, I'm a modeler. I'm not a measurement person. So. I come and I knocked on doors and I looked at people in the lab and would you mind if I bring you air samples from an oil and gas field? And the answer was, yes, we mind. <laughs> we do not want to contaminate our, our labs and our instruments because we are used to measuring what the penguins breathe in the mm -hmm. South Pole and I, we totally don't want to have remains of whatever you bring back from the oil and gas field. So they were nice enough, they told me threshold, they didn't want to see air samples higher than some level of methane, two times background. I said, okay. But I realized that sometimes I could not do that. Sometimes it's just so bad that you're like, and you, when it's so bad, you really want to know what the levels are for some of the toxics, like benzene. So they've learned to accommodate my curiosity, and I try to uh, tells them ahead of time what, are, what samples are the most contaminated and um, it's working well in the end. But So as I mentioned earlier, I work in the Global Monitoring Division and it, it's really a, a big cooperative effort where we have volunteers from all over the world, um, scientists, but they can be also school teachers that go out, like in Mongolia, we have this school teacher that's been working with us and she brings the samples to the uh, US Embassy in Mongolia. We don't want to have anything to do with customs. So we, we have a really amazing network of people that bring us these intact samples of airs and they, they take the samples to Euro uh, and send them to us um, on a regular basis. So we are able to, to get, um, I'm sorry, the everything is covered here. But we have a, a, a global network of some of places where we get air samples. And we try to monitor different things. I mean, not only greenhouse gases, or we look at what depletes the ozone layer in the stratosphere. We measure aerosols on a, at a network of sites also, and uh, radiation. So our goal is to really understand how do uh, local or regional uh, phenomena impact 
long term the global atmosphere. And we feel that oil and gas operation could potentially be something we need to understand better because it could have a, a global impact with a long-lived methane. Methane sticks around for 10 years, okay? If you leak it as methane, it's going to be around for 10 years. And it's so much more potent than CO2. It's, it's something we should be careful and, and not spill. So we have different platforms that we use to do our measurements. And the one I'm most known for is this, the mobile lab. I, I really pushed our people to, to go out there and put the instruments that we used to put on mostly on airplane or just at towers around the country to, to give us some more flexibility and put them in a van. We started with a Prius, soon it became too small and, and we have now this dedicated vehicle that we can drive around and measure different air pollutant rates. And, and that gives us uh, an amazing tool to, to get close to sources. What we do also to, um, to look at more species, because you understand we have a finite volume here that we can fill in, we take um, we take air samples in flasks and that the suitcases that we have at the top, I love that they come in, a, in wine bottle suitcases, <laughs> I think that's great. Um, so we, we have these, um, these suitcases with 12 glass flasks in them that we can fill on demand with a compressor uh, shown here too. And we have different instruments in our lab at NOAA here in Boulder that we look at what's in the air and we have uh, colleagues at CU also who look at isotopes and different hydrocarbons for us. So it's a, we are able to leverage for this kind of study what we use for our global and national network. And, and I feel that having NOAA, a, a federal lab with a, a very strong uh, uh, respect in terms of how well they know what they do and how well they, they, um, they make the data available and, and, and transparent, to, to be able to leverage our expertise to, to study local problems like oil and gas uh, impacts. So where do we go? That's one of our questions, right? We, we have all these tools, we can make these measurements. Where do we go? Well, as Chair mentioned earlier, one of the first impacts that have been detected from oil and gas operations are also non-attainment. And in our EPA Region 8, these are all the states that are in that, uh, one of the regions uh, that the EPA um, how they separate the, the different states in the US. We've had ozone problems in Colorado for a while. So we've been non-attainment officially since 2007, but the problem started a few years earlier. So that's a summertime problem. We've had problem in Wyoming since probably at least 2007, I think. And, and Utah is still unclassified, but they've seen a few years of very high ozone in the winter time. So Wyoming and Utah are winter ozone problem. The front range of Colorado is a summertime ozone problem. And that's where we've been. Uh, we were first, we first went to Wyoming uh, in 2008, and, and people at the time were like, are you sure your measurements are working? Like when you see, you know, over 100 parts per billion, so 0.1 ppm of ozone in the winter, for the first time, you, you don't really trust your measurements. You want to, to send different kinds of instruments to check that they are reading what they should be reading. But that was confirmed by a few different studies over different years and by different instruments. We've gone to the winter basin, um, amazing efforts that the states are doing. I really want to praise what the local states here in the Rocky Mountain regions are doing. They, um, they know they have a problem, but they bring together the resources to, to, to get answers, to, to have the measurements done to help uh, assess and mitigate uh, the problem. So we've gone to Colorado since 2008. It's ongoing work with different teams at NOAA. And uh, most recently, last uh, earlier this month, I was in Texas in the Barnett Shell to look at methane leakage from a place that produces 8% of our natural gas. So it was an amazing, huge natural gas field. And every time we try to deploy an airplane or a van, when we can also, we want to measure, to, to translate what we measure in the atmosphere, we, we measure concentrations, we want to go back to emissions, we need to understand what the uh, dispersion is in the atmosphere, and we measure the winds with uh, really state-of-the-art tools, once again, from NOAA. So wintertime ozone. So if you want to see super high ozone happening in just a matter of a few hours, you have to go to Utah when they have a strong temperature inversion snow on the ground, so it's freezing cold, and there's, 
definitely sunlight. And um, we went last year, but last year, I don't know if you remember, and if you are not in Utah, you won't remember, but we went last year in Utah because in 2011, they had experienced very bad ozone and they were maybe going to become non-attainment and the state was really eager to, to have a early answers to know what to do. And they sent a, a group of like 50 different scientists in the field in February of 2012 and we had the most gorgeous winter with no ozone <laughs> that you could imagine. It was, I mean, I was wearing a t-shirt every day and we were like, when is the snow coming? And it never came. So, but we went again this year. I wasn't there, but uh, a lot of colleagues of mine were there, same team, uh, doing similar measurements. And this time, you could not miss the ozone. The ozone reach worse than what they see in LA, pretty much. 140 ppb um, at the surface in some places in the basin. And what people did is th they used the same kind of instrumentation that we deploy at South Pole to understand what the ozone hole is doing you know, every spring down there. We use the same instrumentation in Utah to tell us what's going on uh, on an hourly basis with the formation of the ozone. So all these profiles that show you ozone into, uh, with altitude are telling you that you're looking at a very fast chemical reaction going on in the atmosphere that lead to amazing levels of ozone that we don't see so much anymore in this country. We used to, but not, not anymore. So we had also an airplane that kind of tell us, when you do measurements at one site, you never know how representative it is of a region. So that's why I like the driving around or having an airplane uh, flying around. And we have a lot of data that we collected with an airplane that showed us uh, that really the ozone was constrained to a, a very thin layer at the surface. And, and we are in the process of analyzing all the data. And we hope that by the end of the summer, we have something we can share with, uh, with the public and the, the different stakeholders. So for the wintertime ozone, um, we know a few of the ingredients that we need. We need local sources. It's a local problem. The, the emissions are usually coming from activities. And in the case of Wyoming and Utah, there's nothing else but oil and gas activities. We need very strong temperature inversion. That means that it's like putting a lid on, uh, on a bowl and the emissions keep accumulating in there. And then the snow on the ground reflects the sunlight and creates enough uh, radiation to, to start the, the cooking going. So we, we know what, in terms of uh, meteorological conditions, what we need. But we need some spark. We need a, a match to start the chemistry. And we are still in the process of analyzing data to understand what the match is that leads to this very rapid ozone formation. And I think we'll get answers in, in the next few months on that. And, and what I want to praise here is, once again, the, the states, EPA, BLM, and also the industry, because they, they don't have to send us there. Like, they could try to use a model, for example, to answer their questions. But they really want to have observations and, uh, and have the best people look at it. So I, I, I think it's an amazing effort that uh, we can all learn from. So in the front range here of Colorado, our problem is the summertime ozone. I want you to be a bit critical here to look at this map from Google Earth where I'm plotting in orange or red all the oil and gas wells in the front range as of sometime last year. And the pink bubbles are our ozone monitors. All right. Where are, where are the monitors? <laughs> Not where they should be, right? So, I mean, oh, no, I should take it back. They are where they should be, or should have been, a long time ago. So in, uh, in Denver, we have a bunch. We have some where they should be, definitely next, close to national parks. Uh, but really, in the gas field, there's not. Okay? So that's a huge problem. We need to have, and I, I think the, the state is trying to move forward to, to put one in Platteville. <coughs> So in the middle of the gas field here, but we need to face it, okay? We need to be reactive. If an industry is booming, we have five times more new wells. No, I mean, the, the number of oil and gas wells, oh, gas wells in Colorado has increased by a factor of five between the mid-90s and today, all right? 
So it's not an industry you can just ignore. It's a big part of our economy, it's a big part of our potential emitters. And, and not having any ozone monitors when we know we have no attainment and that oil and gas operation contributes to the precursors, not having any monitors in the oil and gas field is just uh, childish, maybe. All right, so there's been awesome work done at NOAA by another group uh, in the Chemical Sciences Division, Jessica Gilman. Uh, did some measurements of uh, a longer suite of uh, volatile organic compounds than what my group does. And she's done several campaigns at BO, and she has a paper that came out a few weeks ago for a campaign she did in 2011, where she shows that a lot of the reactivity, so a lot of the potential to make ozone, uh, it can be totally attributed to oil and gas activities. So that's something that the state is totally aware of, that's why we regulate oil and gas operations. But it's really nice to have this kind of um, measurement-based uh, conclusion because that's something we can assess in the model. Like if we put certain emissions from Denver and the urban um, mobile sources, for example, and you put in there uh, what we think is coming from oil and gas activities, is the model giving us the same kind of number? That's going to be a really key test to see if we, we have the emissions right and the mix of emissions right uh, here at the state level. Another nice piece of work that was done by Owen Cooper, again at NOAA, he looked at rural ozone levels at rural sites across the US, and I, if you're interested in ozone levels and how it's changed over time from 1990 to 2010, his paper is an amazing analysis of what's been going on over the past uh, two decades. And he shows that in the western US and also in the Rocky Mountain uh, National Park here locally, we don't see a decrease in ozone when we see it in the eastern US. And, and, and specifically for our local site here, our national park and the western US, we, we know there's been an increase in background ozone coming from Asia. So that's one of the, probably one of the reasons we don't see a, a, a decrease in our local ozone levels. There's also, there's been an increase in the summer in temperature uh, in, in Colorado, so that could contribute also to uh, in increasing the ozone production. But uh, there's this big question here, are, have the emissions of the precursors of ozone increased? And that's something that um, is being looked at. So I want to show you some data. This is the data that took me um, brought me to study oil and gas activities and their impacts uh, for the past few years. We have this tower in Erie, the Boulder Atmospheric Observatory. It's a 300 meter tall tower where we collect an air sample every afternoon. And we've been doing that since 2008. We have amazing wind measurements. Wind is a hard thing to measure, believe it or not. If you want to be very competitive, it, it's something that takes a lot of care. We have wind measurements that tell us where the air mass has been that we sample. And we can look, I mean, wh what I've been doing since 2008 is try to understand how the air mass from Denver compares with the air mass that's coming from the oil and gas field. And here we're looking at what we call in, in, in our carbon correlation plots, where we try to understand when we measure methane, for example, uh, on the plot here at the top, does, what does it correlate with? Like, when methane is enhanced, what else is enhanced? And we see that for the red, dots that are coming from the oil and gas field, we see that when we see methane, we see propane. propane. So we know that both are in natural gas. We know that methane can come from cows also, or from landfills, as Jenna explained. But when you see that this methane correlates so well with the propane, could be that they come from the same source, and not just the cows, okay? So there's some indication in there that uh, natural gas is leaking from the oil and gas field. When you look now at this butane and propane, amazing correlation, amazing um, indication that you see natural gas in your air. Okay, if you live in Erie, you probably know. But we see it in Boulder a lot too, so it's not just Erie being impacted. Now let's look at benzene. Benzene, um, if you look at the EPA inventory, 80% of the benzene in the US is coming from cars. Okay, and you would expect acetylene, it's the chemical, um, it's C2H2, it's a tracer that's emitted when you have combustion. And you see that for the samples collected in Denver, uh, or coming from you know, the south side in blue, 
you see a very nice correlation between benzene and acetylene that tells you you're looking at um, something that's been impacted by mobile sources. And, and that's not quite what you see for the red points. The red points are telling you, okay, we have this, ur this urban and mobile source here, but there's something else that's putting benzene to the air. And that's where you look at benzene versus propane, ben propane being in the natural gas. And you see another correlation there, for, especially for the air masses impacted by the oil and gas activities. So clearly, there are two sources of benzene in the region at least. Mobile sources and natural gas and oil activities. And that's something that um, is not really well described in inventories. How much benzene really is coming out of these oil and gas wells. So now I'm going to move on to propane, and I know I'm late, so I'll try to speed up a little bit, uh, to methane, sorry. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, methane is the first ingredient in natural gas. It's a very potent greenhouse gas. Um, in the US, EPA um, assesses that 30% of the uh, methane emissions in the country are due to natural gas and oil systems. We, we need to understand the emissions better because it's a, it's a big... Uh, it's a big actor in, in climate change. And we need to understand how the emissions and the leak of, of natural gas differ in different regions. So we've talked about that. I want you to ponder on this graph, and I'm sorry if it's gonna take a, a few more of your neurons to fire up when we look at this graph. But that's the world I live with every day where I'm trying to make sense of what comes out of EPA. So EPA, as I, we said before, you know, when you were looking at the storage, you know, they, they put boxes, well, that's how they build their inventory. They try to keep track, how many wells do we have, how many were fractures within the year, how many compressors do we have, blah, blah, blah. And then they come up with how much methane was emitted around the country from natural gas activities. And every year they come up with a, what I call, don't take it badly if you work at EPA, I call it an incarnation of the emissions. So in 2010, they told us that the emissions of methane were at this level. It's one teragram of methane per year from natural gas system. You're like, great. This uh, vertical bar is the uncertainty. So if you are a I mean, you know that scientists, we love to know what the uncertainty is because we're never sure, right? So small uncertainty means you're pretty sure, but you're never right. Well, 2011 comes along, and poof, we jump so high I cannot reach it. And it's not <laughs> Al Gore with the CO2 rise, right? It's not that, yeah, I don't need an elevator to jump there. But, so we increase from one to six teragram. And the reason they tell in their, you know, lengthy chapters that they uh, write every year to, to explain how, why they think they make the inventory better. Um, so they say, we've taken into account fracturing of unconventional wells and liquid unloading at all these wells and blah, blah, blah. And then they put another uncertainty. What's amazing is that if, if you were a scientist, you would wonder why the uncertainties do not overlap. Okay, like, what are we, why were you so sure now? Why are you so sure? Why were you so sure a year ago when now? When it, I mean, it's a totally different picture that you're portraying. Now we are in 2013, they have released a new inventory, they always go back to 1990, that's how we do it for greenhouse gases, like with the, the um, developed countries have to report their estimates of greenhouse gases emissions to the UN, okay, and it's always back to 1990. And, and what you see now is that we are in the middle of the road, all right? We had this earlier estimate that we thought was very low. We had an estimate that made the industry cringe and wonder what EPA was coming up with when they were come, you know, releasing a much higher number. And, and now we have this, I don't know if it's a happy middle, but it's a new estimate and frankly I put a big question mark on all that because I'm not sure I can trust any of that. So the big question is can we use atmospheric measurements? To, to know what really is coming out of these uh, oil and gas basins. And um, I think we can. So you have all these potential sources, and actually actual sources, on the ground, 
we have thousands of oil and gas wells, hundreds of miles of pipelines, you create, I mean, it's pretty amazing. Like, I should end up with a story, but I, I, I drove back once at night from Utah to Colorado and going on I-70, you were in this pool of this bubble of methane at night. That was just amazing. And you reached Grand Junction, which is the end of the Western Slope oil and gas activities. You get out of it, you have fresh air. But like, and, and what, when you do that in the Winter Basin or Wyoming, just driving at night where, you know, the mixing layer compresses and the emissions just accumulate in this shallow layer of atmosphere. This is just striking. For somebody who's used to looking at very uh, subtle gradients between, you know, the North and the South Pole, you're like in this, not pure methane, obviously it's not most of the atmosphere, but it's just phenomenal. So we trust the wind, we trust that the sources are there, and we just want to go downwind and measure the methane coming out of different places. And when I was telling you that we have bubbles and plumes of swimming pools of methane, that's an example of what we measured last year in Utah when it was a balmy, probably 40 or 50 degrees there. The color tells you the different uh, concentrations of methane, and you see that it's very constrained to the region, and when we looked at the oil field on, on the western side, we didn't see as high methane as we see as we saw in the gas field. And what's amazing in Utah is that everything correlates with methane. The benzene correlates with methane. It's not something that we see here. But like you, you're seeing, once again, natural gas in the air. So what are we doing? And I'm sorry for the typos. Um, we're trying to use our measurements, and right at this moment, we are working night and day to convert our atmospheric measurements into emissions estimates so that we can check the incarnation of the different inventories that come up at the, at the local or regional level and, and, and see where we stand in terms of, of, of the leak rate of the natural gas. We also, one of my major work has been to, to go to individual sources and understand what do they, what do they emit, what, what do we see from from the tanks, what do we see from this uh, pump jack, for example, what's coming out of the dehydrators and, and separators to, to try to help inventory developers uh, focus their attention potentially to, to specific processes in the oil and gas field. And there's a dialogue going on. I mean, the NSF proposal is helping this dialogue also. Uh, we want to share our results that are always peer reviewed and make them relevant as soon as possible so that we can uh, sooner than later mitigate problems. Um, we have a few questions that uh, we, we are working on. We want to understand and, and quantify the difference between potential versus actual emissions. We are working hard to understand the mechanism behind the wintertime ozone. We want to understand emissions are my big uh, thing in life, so I want to understand what's driving the emissions, how accurate inventories are, etc. And we want to understand how successful we are when industry or state choose to have specific regulation or mitigations put in place. But one other thing we need to work on, I think, for the local community more and, and, and sooner than later again, is what are the exposures? Like methane is not going to kill you, propane is not going to kill you. We need to understand these uh, hazardous air pollutants. What are people exposed to on an acute basis or chronic basis? So I will end up there. I'm sorry I took so long to talk. And uh, we'll be happy, Jenna and I, to take questions. I will uh, start off with a, a couple of questions that um, you may uh, say, well, this, well, actually, these may be things that you know about or think about. Um, the Parachute Creek leak, is that leak affecting the air as well as the groundwater? And you are certainly free to say, you haven't really followed that. Or um, I don't know the answer to the question. I read about the leak, but... <laughs> I mean, without okay. being there to measure, I cannot say. Okay. Oh, oh, excuse me, I just forgot. Uh, the people who are going to correct your pre-surveys will want to do that right now. Pardon me, I shifted too fast on that. So uh, the pre-survey people, do you want to circulate around and you can pass them into the middle? I beg pardon? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch you there. What? Oh, you can turn. Oh, I thought you said you wanted them separately. Did you change your mind or did you? <laughs> What's going on here? So why don't you uh, pass your... One of you was very emphatic about that, and is still being emphatic. So, okay, so pass the pre-surveys till the to the middle, 
so that the emphatic person here who influenced me very deeply with his emphaticness. Uh, so a couple of, of, again, just sort of more technical questions, I guess. Is the design value, I think I'll wait till we just have these move a little bit more. Okay. Um, Alrighty, is the design value for ozone a value used nationally and internationally? If it is tracked nationally and internationally, how many years has it been standard? So the, the standard for ozone is a national standard. Um, other countries and the um, World Health Organization have standards for ozone as well. And we've had an ozone standard since the Clean Air Act, at a national level since the Clean Air Act was first passed um, in its current form in 1970. That standard has changed over time. And one of the really interesting uh, potential developments is that there's um, consideration of changing the standard again um, to lower it. Um, and the EPA's experts have recommend lowering it to a level of 60 to 70 parts per million or parts per billion rather, 0.06 to 0.07 parts per million, from the current 0.075. And if you recall the information that I showed for Western Colorado, um, most of those locations would not be meeting that standard. And the reason for lowering it is some concern that the current standard is not adequately protected. So. Okay, um, how long is the longest pipeline that carries methane? Okay, I just got every question gets asked here. So if you... Um, Google will get to that. Okay. Um, well, Department of Transportation, if you want to know everything about pipelines, DOT is the department that shares that kind of information. Okay. You say ozone is bad. In the recent past, scientists have said that the ozone, ozone layer is important to human existence, and we had to, among other things, replace inexpensive coolants and autos with expensive non-ozone eating coolants and stop using aerosol propellant things such as hairspray. I can tell you the hairspray thing has been very troubling to, to <laughs> me. Um, who is correct? Is ozone trouble or good news? Well, ozone up high is good, ozone down low is bad. All right, so that's, uh, yeah, the, the ozone at 20 kilometers high protects you from the UV radiation coming from the sun. Uh, ozone uh, down low is, uh, is very bad for your, for your lungs and other, other systems. So. Um, up high good, down low bad, and uh, if we could move it, we could fix the other moments. Uh, we always have our Halliburton exception question. With the Halliburton loophole, isn't all this compliance by the industry both voluntary and at their convenience? So I, I, the Halliburton loophole doesn't apply That's um, what from an air quality perspective or an emissions perspective, and, and so there are um, many, many regulations um, at state and federal level that um, firmly regulate um, emissions from, from these sources that we've been talking about. There um, are additional voluntary compliance efforts, and as I mentioned, that um, industry has been moving forward with some of those for many years, but there are firm regulations and laws in place that require compliance. In most cases. And I think I'm obligated to press you a little bit more on this because we have a couple on this. How are the oil and gas companies, I guess I'm asking, I'm interpreting this to be, does the Halliburton loophole apply to a larger dilemma of, which I shall now put forward, how are the oil and gas companies uh, to be held accountable when the laws of responsibility do not apply to them? Is the loophole symptomatic of a larger failure of regulatory energy or or supervision and no, control? I, mean, I think most of the regulation has been done at the state level right now for state or private land when you are on um, or public land, but when you are on Indian land, it's different now. You, where you have, uh, like in the winter basin, very, very different. What you see on the ground is very different than what you see somewhere else. So I think uh, regulation is one thing, where it applies is another, and how it's um, checked is another one too. So I think Colorado is, is really a leader in terms of regulation and having, having industry work together with the regulators to, to, to show their best and to do the best in the field. Most of what I see driving around is going to be usually problems um, that, that should not occur, but that it's not the mainstream that you have a lot of leaks. 
what we probably understood from looking at the Utah pool of ozone or methane is that it's a different story down there, and we have a paper coming out hopefully soon that will not explain why, but will explain the extent of what we think the problem is. And, uh, and I think there needs to be more open communication between the different operators down there and whoever regulates to, to see how, how things can be fixed. Okay, and now you wondered, would we get to methane? And we are. Now we're going more directly to the questions, uh, or d questions directly from your talk. When methane escapes, how fast does it spread up by being buoyant, and how fast by, by diffusion? Is it more concentrated at higher altitudes after it equilibrates? Wow. <laughs> That's kind of a question my daughter would ask. <laughs> uh, it's really, I mean, it's very cute, but um, we, we usually think, like for in the winter, they think that was our first study where we flew the plane to try to understand what's coming in our basin and what's exiting the basin, and by measuring the difference, we, we can tell what's being emitted. Well, it's going to take a few hours for the basin to flush when you have, you know, decent rain of five, six meters per second. So usually what happens in the boundary layer is so turbulent that you will mix the methane within a matter of 30 minutes. It will mix pretty well from where it's emitted at the surface to the top of the boundary layer, which is going to be a kilometer high in, in February, in sunny conditions. And then to, to flush the basin, depending on wind speed, uh, it can take a, a few hours. So I hope that answers the question. We can talk more offline in stairs. Uh, when the methane is flared, is this producing less methane than if it just vents? Or less, oh, excuse me, less greenhouse gases. Sorry, I didn't quite. That one. When the methane is flared, is this producing less greenhouse gases than if it just vents? Yes. Yes. I mean, w when you flare a uh, natural gas stream, you're going to convert the methane to CO2. So instead of waiting for the atmosphere to do that for you, that's going to take 10 years, you're burning it into CO2 quicker. And since the global warming potential of methane is so much higher than CO2, you've done the earth a good, a good deal of you know, uh, burning it right away. And, one of the issues is, for example, in cities or close to urban areas, operators sometimes think, or oh, the local community is very scared of seeing flares, but they are good for you, okay, they are good for the climate. So you'd rather see it burn than just uh, be ignored, or not be ignored, but just be empty. Okay, and now, um, I think you can use the word fracking or fracturing now, I think you're speaking <laughs> that. So questions about emissions particular to fracking. Uh, as well quantities increase, will negative atmospheric impacts increase proportionately or disproportionately with those, be, or excuse me, as fracking wells, well quantities increase, will negative atmospheric impacts increase proportionately or disproportionately? Will we have worse impacts from wells that are fracked than we had from the previous generation of wells? Well, I, you probably noticed that I didn't mention, I don't think I mentioned fracking except once in my talk. I have not made that specifically except on one occasion, and it was in Utah, and I've had, I've done some measurements, uh, more like opportunistic measurements whenever you're in the field, there's a good chance you will see this kind of operation. Um, we don't see much methane coming out of that. The flow back, depending on how it's handled, can be a disaster or can be something you don't even notice. Okay? So, green completion works. And we need that to be the standard, and that's what EPA is pushing for with the new source performance standard that will take effect in, in January 2015 across the board for all the states. Uh, green completion is something we have to do in the front range, so we're already in good hands here in the front range of Colorado. But I, I think uh, I'm always puzzled when I, I give interviews and journalists end up using fracking in the title of something where they describe my work because that's really not something I've put the emphasis because I don't think it's a big part of the problem. It can be for a short time, uh, and, and maybe potentially with spills for water resources, but for the atmosphere, if it's done well, it's not a problem. And we, we need to get the attention now put on leaks and fugitive emissions, and, and, and get more work done on that to, uh, to, to put the right pressure on what needs to be fixed, and not use fracking as uh, a cover for all the problems that we have for the oil and gas industry when really they know how to do it well and in most cases they do it well. Okay, I think I'm uh, repeating myself here but if there's anything you want to add I just want to make sure all the questions get heard so what are the worst air quality problems associated with fracking that are documented and I think you have kind of just gone there 
Is it common or rare? How much methane has escaped because of fracking? What contribution to greenhouse gases has that made? So I think you just went through that whole routine. But Jenna, if you were thinking, oh, count me in too, is there anything you want to add to, to that as well? I, know, I think that the only thing I would add is that, of, of course, one thing that fracking has done is it's opened up unconventional gas resources in areas that were previously not economically viable. And, and so um, it, it is leading to, to circumstances and situations where gas production is occurring. Right. It's not so much that that particular stage of production is, is especially problematic. Uh, could you remind us about the two types of methane? I guess biogenic and thermogenic? Or? Right, so depending, and I studied geology in my previous life too, and that's really cool to be able to look at geology maps. I mean, the front range is just a beautiful uh, place to be when you know geology. Uh, depending on how deep, so in one of my slides I explained that all these organic matters that was buried under, you know, uh, thousands of feet of sediments got cooked down there and either it's cooked and it becomes thermo thermogenic and it's a specific signature in terms of what you see together or the isotopic signature of methane but when it doesn't go so deep but you have bacteria do the work for you of transforming this organic matter dead plants uh, in, into a gas then it's called biogenic and, and that by, by looking at both uh, at different signatures in the methane you try to understand where it's coming from and that can tell you, for example, if you have methane in a water well, try to understand is it coming from down deep, the formation that a gas well would look and, and uh, produce from, or is it coming from more shallow layers that are bearing uh, biogenic methane and it's probably always been in your water well. So uh, it's very important to not just measure methane when you look at methane as a tracer of of, of natural gas, it's uh, to, to understand where the, the natural gas in water, for example, is coming from. Uh, understanding if it's biogen or thermogen is a big piece of the answer that we're looking for. Okay, I, I just seem to be obsessed and unable to leave the question that I just keep asking you, but I do want to reflect that this is something very much on the audience's mind. Uh, on a pound for pound comparison basis, what, in your opinion, is the lesser of evils between fracking and standard drilling? I think you have spoken to that. But I'm going to connect it to this question about, because this is as much I think about public perception as what atmospheric testing is showing, have emission regulations changed over the past decades in response to perceptions of hydraulic fracturing as conveying a different kind of risk? It has, and I think Jenna can tell you more about that. It has in some places, and that's why I think EPA is trying to uh, have a, the best lower denominator by pushing for regulation at the national level. And to enter into it back in 2015, but I think a, a lot has been done on fracking. So, so I, I would attribute, we, we are seeing increasingly stringent regulation, and, and I think we'll continue to see tightening regulations as things move forward. Um, I attribute it really to the, the boom in natural gas production and, and the level of activity that we're seeing in some areas where we hadn't seen it previously. I also attribute it to um, additional monitoring. So it was in 2005 where they started monitoring ozone levels in the um, Sublet County in Wyoming, first recognized this wintertime ozone problem, and subsequent to that, Wyoming really um, instituted additional regulations for oil and gas operations. Um, the one uh, really specific regulation that's come into place um, for fracking specifically is this requirement for green completions. Um, and that was adopted in Colorado in 2008. Um, uh, was adopted in Wyoming a couple, a couple years earlier, actually, just for um, Western Wyoming. And um, will, as Gabby mentioned, become part of the federal requirements um, effective in 2015 nationwide. Can you share your thoughts about the fugitive methane rates from unconventional gas development I can't seem to get past that subject with you, um, but now I'm going to get quantitative here. Is it 8% as in Howard's studies or 1.5% as in MIT? What research needs to be done? What is being done? Well, we're in the process of finishing papers that are just giving the numbers, but I, I cannot cite numbers that have not been peer-reviewed. Okay, so if you, the person interested can contact me and I can let you know as soon as our papers get peer-reviewed. Uh, that they are out and uh, we can share these results with you in, in a few months. That's the million dollar question. Okay. 
Um, I don't have any other billion. Well, I do actually. I have very large scale and ambitious questions here in a moment. But can oil and gas wells, including fracking, oh, this is a big one, uh, can, this, can those wells, including fracking and drilling, be done safely if proper regulations are in place and followed? That's a billion dollar question, too. Huh. <laughs> Some places are cleaner than others. So that's. Some places are, are cleaner than others, the way the development is going. So, and that's usually it's cleaner where it's more regulated. So that's an indication that there's potential. This question, I think, might be for a. Uh, legal speaker later on, but if you've been in this world, feel free to jump in there. How do people who want to set up private lease agreements become knowledgeable enough to do that? How do they know about regulations? What is possible to demand in a lease agreement? What are the issues to consider? Okay, you went to law school. I did. <laughs> and one of the things you've learned in law school is when to defer to someone else. I think that okay. would be okay. a good question. I would have done it faster than that. Okay. Uh, then, these are uh, very important big scale requests here. Uh, in order of, in fact, they're so connected, well actually I'll just, I'll just do this one first. Uh, in order of threat or damage to public health on the front range, rank auto exhaust, coal power plants, indoor pollution, and gas production. And that's actually pretty much this other one too. So, you got it. Depends where you live. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me where you live and we can find out what's going on. I think it's going to be probably more important if you're a small group because in Colorado you don't. I mean, it depends where you live, you know, how close you are to some of the sources of pollution. And uh, we cannot give general answers to a question like that. I, I mean, that's another excellent question and it's excellent because it's difficult to answer. So. Well, these billion dollar questions are exactly. have to be picked up here on. Um, I'm amazed by how much, yeah, uh, how acute everybody is here. I mean, I, I know it's uh, not the people. I'm not the people. But it's past eight now. Um, uh, oh, yes, but we, I'm down to my I'm last amazed. two, and one of them is so targeted at you. Get okay. That, okay. okay. Um, and this, this one, I should have had this one a little bit earlier in the more detailed thing. Silicosis has recently been found to affect workers at fracking sites, what are the implications for nearby homes in terms of air quality and silicosis? Don't be there when it happens. <laughs> it's the sand that they use to frack. I mean, obviously, I mean, there's ways to limit how much of the sand, you know, uh, the puffs of sand that escape. Like, it's really a known disease. I mean, that if it, you breathe that too much, it, you can affect your lungs long term. So, I mean, one advice is yes, when cracking is happening, don't be there. Okay. Huh. Hey, and here, this, I'm sorry, Jen, I do not know your country of origin, of immigrant <laughs> origin, but has France banned fracking? Why? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have a moratorium on fracking in France, and I think it's going to be revised. I think the EU, I heard, just sent a positive message to the different countries in the EU to allow fracking and to let unconventional uh, exploration happen. Uh, our French company, uh, Total, in France, is just so desperate to explore what we have under our country. The big difference in France is that the, country, the state of the country owns all the mineral rights. So you can understand that landowners have no interest in seeing this kind of activity happen in the backyard. And a lot of our unconventional gas is where we have a lot of agricultural uh, activities going on, and we have limited water resources too, so it's, uh, we'll see what happens. Tempting to do a follow-up on France's enthusiasm for nuclear power. Is it? <laughs> yes, yes. Should I not do that? Or should, should oh, you should. It? You okay. should. <laughs> shall I do it to someone else instead of, <laughs> instead of you? Well, shall I call it a night? I should probably I think it. it's great. Okay. Yes, thank okay, you so good. much for coming. Thank, uh, thank you, and join me in thanking our